All right, well, let me uh, start back. Everybody tune in here. Um, questions about this, the, the specified complexity? Because I really do think this is like, this is a big, big deal. <laughs> uh, because again, it just hooks up so much with, obviously, with the way in which we do life already. We, we already, um, right? I mean, we don't have as jurors uh, forensic scientists. We have forensic scientists that will present evidence and things like that, but the jurors ultimately make a decision, just regular folks, I mean, so to speak, uh, make decisions on, on court cases and murder cases and, and things like that. And largely what they're, you know, a uh, prosecutor's hoping for, if, you know, the prosecutor, he or she believes that uh, person's guilty is that somebody would spot the design and, and see that the only person that fits the bill for this sort of crime, this crime specifically, is the you know the defendant or whatever. Um, and it's that exact sort of thing. You're, you're looking for specified complexity. What's, what's a pattern that fits this person? Right? What, what's a, what, it, maybe it's fingerprints or maybe it's, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of weapon or it's a, some feature, some fact that's at the scene of the crime. Um, Jay Warner Wallace was one big crime that he, he cracked. It was a cold case. He was featured on Dateline, and he's been on Dateline a bunch of times. He's now a Christian apologist, but um, and it had to do with a piece, a foam piece that was found at the scene of the crime, and uh, nobody knew what it was from. It turns out the defendant would like kick his boot off, and some you like, like sort of push his boot off with his other foot, and he wore out all of his shoes in the same exact way, and he still had this boot that had the foam. Piece missing, which was the link. Again, it's sort of like when you think about specified complexity, uh, the foam piece didn't just fall from the ceiling, it didn't fall out of the sky, it didn't pop into existence, right? It came from somewhere, and you're detecting when you do detective work, uh, design. And that's largely what we're doing when we look at the world, uh, or we just look at go throughout our day when we're saying, go home to your house, and you know, again, you see your kid's room, and he's it's got stuff all over the place or whatever, um, you can sort of detect what he's up to or not, as opposed to something blew up in his room or, or the, wind, the window was open and the wind blew up. You know, that sort of stuff, we can detect design. So I think this is kind of a, I think this is a big thing. And then we're looking at the world and saying, look, how could this world have come to be the way that it is? And we'll talk about some of those conditions here in a minute. With this pattern, namely us, human life, and just and there's lots of things that figure into human life, of course, animal life, plant life, uh, even features of our solar system and, and planet and so on. I think Metaxas talked about the properties of water being so odd, the, proper, uh, the, uh, the facts about the moon being so odd that they shouldn't be this way, but they are. Um, the chances of them, I mean, it's hugely improbable. And so the claim is, can you spot specificity here? Can you spot a pattern? And that's where we want to say, it's pattern all over the place. This is, all, this is wherever we look. Okay, any questions on, on specified complexity? I just want to make sure you get it. Okay, so I'm not sure it's blowing your mind like it should be. Uh, but I'll move on. Okay, there's also what we sometimes refer to as irreducible complexity which is different. Um, it, but this is the Behe stuff that, you, that you'll read this week. Uh, Michael Behe, who wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box, which Behe's an interesting figure because I don't believe he is he's not a Christian. Um, is he an agnostic? I know there's a big guy at the Discovery Institute that's an agnostic. But um, in, in, mo in many ways, this is a problem for Darwinian, Darwinism. Um, Darwinian evolution. And it's this sort of problem is that there are many, many, I mean mind-blowingly many systems, true of you and true of other biological life forms, that, that seem to be irreducibly complex. So that you would have to have 
intermediate steps, right, for all this sort of, you know, you take a, say, a complex system like the function of the eye, the eyeball, right? There's a bunch of things that have to be there in order for, the, for you to have eyesight. You take one piece away and you don't have eyesight, you're blind. The, the claim was how could the how could a system like the eyeball, like the the visual faculty that that we have, that animals have, uh, all the way down, how could you have sort of like half an eyeball, right? And have any kind of functionality for that in order for Darwinian evolution, natural selection, and so forth to sort of take over and and pass that on as an advantage. If there's no functionality to it, it's not an advantage. In fact. In many cases, it'll be a disadvantage, right? Having a kind of, this is kind of gross, but gooey patch on one's head, on an on a, on a animal's head or something, doesn't give them any advantage to be able to pass that on by natural selection. Right? Does that make sense to you? It's irreducibly complex. It seems to have to show up functional. But in order for it to show up functional, Right? How could you have these incremental steps for that? How could you have, unless it's this wildly crazy uh, mutation that occurred where you have a non-sighted animal and then there's this wild mutation and now there's a sighted an animal. That's, that's in effect what I think one would have to believe if one were to believe that Darwinian evolution brought it about that we have things like eyesight and so on. And that's just one of many, 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 many examples the one that uh, Behe talks a lot about is the flagellum of the bacterial um, cell. I guess I guess it is, right? Where it's this it's this crazy complex motor. Basically, it's like an outboard boat motor. <laughs> it's got a propeller that spins. Uh, I've heard him talk about this as it's spinning something in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand RPM. Nobody, again, nobody's mind is blown by this. Okay, uh, right, and, and it can and it can stop within a half turn or a quarter turn. It can stop and shift the other direction and and pick back up to 100,000 RPMs. Um, 100,000 RPMs. Did I say that right? Um, it's got a drive shaft. It's got like bearings. It's got uh, like everything a motor would have. It's got right there. And it's this, again, it's this sort of complex system that seems to be irreducibly complex, at least at a certain point. Right now, you could lose probably some parts of your eye and there still be functionality, right? I mean, people do get surgeries after all, or you might lose a, a little part, part of your eye. But it, as long as no crucial pieces of it are, are lost, you still have eyesight. But the point is that you dial that down just a little bit more, eventually you're going to have pieces that... that are absolutely necessary for eyesight. And so you've gotten down to that, that layer of complexity that's irreducibly complex in order for there to be functionality. And that's why I say it's a big problem for Darwinism. Darwin has that quote uh, of saying, right, if, if it could be shown that the complexity of life didn't come about by incremental steps, then his whole theory should be thrown out. And he says this in The Origin of the Species. And basically, this is what Behe's point is, is that you can't. You can't get this by incremental steps, because at some point you have irreducible complexity. And you have to sort of all show up at once. Now, sometimes the, the mouse trap is used as the example for this, right? So a mouse trap's fairly simple. It's got certain pieces to it. If you were to, you know, the, the hook that sort of like keeps the, the, the spring from coming out, or whatever you call that. Um, if the hook wasn't there, then it wouldn't have anything to keep it back. It wouldn't have, again, functionality. Um, now, I have seen one <laughs> atheist, at least, that said, sure, it'd have functionality. And he clips it to his tie and says it'd be a, a tie clip. Yeah, it could be a tie clip, a, a mouse trap for that. Okay. Um, and that was mostly meant as a joke, I hope. Uh, because the point is to say, well, of course the mousetrap didn't evolve or wasn't designed in that intermediate step with a tie clip, and then we thought, hey, you know what, this will work as, a, as you know, killing mice and things. Um, but that's what you'd have to say. You'd have to have some sort of functionality for every little incremental step along the way to eyesight, and it's hard to see what other functionality 
you know, the eye socket and the, the retina and all these things as they're developing would have in order to pass that on by natural selection, right? Now, again, sometimes traits are passed on uh, not for the advantage that it gives a, an organism, but just as a matter of mutation and, and it just happens to sort of pass it on, but that's very unusual. It's typically passed on because it gives that organism a kind of advantage, and then that, uh, the one that has that feature takes over the population. Everybody clear on how, I think we've talked about this a little bit, right? So that, you know, if the beak, if, if a bird uh, has a mutation and the beak is really long, and it can now get at a food source that the other beaks, uh, that the other uh, birds of the stubby beaks can't get to, well, eventually the, all the birds of that population are going to come out being with the longer beaks, because eventually all the other ones aren't going to get the food well enough, they're not going to leave as much offspring, and pretty soon that population will become dominated by the skinny, longer beaked uh, birds. So that's how the natural selection works, but how, what story could you possibly tell for all the intermediate steps of uh, uh, vis vision faculty? See what I mean? All the, all the pieces that need to be there just right, You'd have to have all of those developing independently for other sorts of functionality, um, right? Or just complete lucking out, lucking out, uh, completely getting lucky, right? Which seems so very, very implausible. Like so, what I, I typically say, and I say this with my College students, as we're, as we're reading through something like Darwin, uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species, will say, I will say, look, I'm, there are, of course, Christians who are, would say that they're Darwinists, right? Now, I think, I think it's an odd fit, and I don't, but what I always say is, I think as Christians, we can in some ways be the most unbiased individuals in this discussion to say, let's look at the evidence. God could have used evolution. That seems to be, I mean, I think there's biblically there's issues and so on, but I'm just saying, sort of conceptually speaking, this doesn't rule out the existence of God. Maybe God used evolution to a pretty great degree. Maybe not. I still think we can make good on you know the various passages there with that. Um, I think when you look at Genesis 1 and 2, I think what you see is God creating the world, and I also think God created various pieces of the world specially. And I think you have to be committed to that. But that leaves lots of room for some evolution to occur. The big question is how much. When I look at the case, I just don't find it plausible that Darwinian evolution has occurred to a very great degree. Like the scientific evidence doesn't seem to lead us there. I know why my atheist friends are Darwinians, why they hold the Darwinian evolution, or probably something like neo-Darwinism. It's because there's... How else do they get biological life if they're atheists? Right? How do you get all the biological diversity that we see in the world other than something like evolution? But my Christian friends, I, I don't think we've got a reason at all to be Darwin. I mean, not, not to an extensive degree to be Darwinists. In fact, let me, let me take out the word Darwin and put evolution. Right? Some bits of microevolution has occurred, like the, the bird population. That's evolution. Right, the fact that our flu shots worked for like maybe never uh, as part of this year, it seems uh, that's evolution. The the flu strand changed, it evolved. So there's microevolution. The question is how much macroevolution, and I just don't find it plausible that there's a great degree of macroevolution. When I look at all these problems, right, I think God created sighted animals at a certain point. I just don't think the evidence bears out that you can have all these intermediate steps of going from non-sighted to sighted animals. So that's a pretty, that's pretty, again, a pretty powerful argument to say. I mean, so it's a, it's a problem for evolution, but then it leaves us with a vacuum. Because if evolution didn't bring about the bi biological diversity, how, how did the biological diversity get here? And that's where we, we would infer design. All right, we have a kind of specified complexity here, too. Yeah, I think that's the next slide. No, it's not the next slide. Okay, sorry. So iridescent complexity leads us to the design inference to say, look, if we can't explain this in any other way, there is no naturalist explanation for this. And again, if it fits this sort of 
uh, pattern, then we then we make a, a design inference. All right, questions, irreducible complexity, see how that works? They're all over the place. I mean, there, there are, and I was just uh, looking at something that they were saying, I mean, even if you could figure out these intermediate steps to the bacterium uh, flagellum, bacteria flagellum, uh, the little outboard motor that's on the bacteria cell, um, you, you also have the problem of a kind of like uh, a building stage to this. Uh, and again, I'm, talk I'm coming to this as a layperson, so I may not say all this exactly right, but uh, that a biologist would be able to do far better. Um, there's this sort of building stage to the cell that has to be like sort of specified itself. So you've got these, so you've got a kind of design plan, so to speak, for the building of that too that you would have to explain. Like how did that get into place? That's, that, that in a way is built from other sorts of um, systems. So you have irreducible complexity upon irreducible complexity. That again, if, if, our, if our explanation falls short, we look to some other explanation and I think we're led back to a design sort of inference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I mean, uh, there and I. It's like you could spend the rest of your life just like discovering new sorts of facts like that um, about how intricate life is all the way down. And I, you know, there is oftentimes the uh, intelligent design folks will say things like, "We can let this pass if we're in the 19th century." Like some of some of these sorts of things that are said are are really predicated on 19th century understanding, sort of Darwin's understanding of the cells, and biology, and things like that. Because the idea was, as I understand it, that the the idea that the, the sort of basic building block was this undifferentiated like goo, basically, or jelly, or something, a very simple sorts of stuff that just sort of replicated or or or, or um, evolved into you and me somehow. Sort of put them together and you get this. They had no idea that the cell itself, right, was intricately complex, radically complex, with all these systems interlocking and working together so that, you know, again, the idea was, well, these simple cells like a bacteria, uh, cells in a bacteria, that's, there's not much going on there. That's pretty simple, but as we've as we've kind of gotten the ability to look into these things, literally, uh, we see complexity upon complexity upon complexity and, and systems uh, all the way down, so that there really is no such thing as a simple cell, a simple celled organism. It's a one-celled organism, but those are r themselves radically complex, and so on. All right. Uh, and again, leads us all, I think, straight to uh, the creator, uh, sustainer, designer. All right, um, let's turn then to the fine-tuning argument now. This is a kind of design argument, but now we're going to see specified complexity in the cosmos, uh, especially uh, as it relates to the initial conditions of the universe. So here's how this argument goes. The fine-tuning of the universe is due either, right? notice in the premise it's assuming fine-tuning because this truly is a discovery, like it's discovered that the universe is fine-tuned. Now, people might not like that word, fine-tuning, because it sounds almost like designed, uh, that there's, there's a, it seems like it implies by definition a design, a tuner, um, <laughs> right? That's, that's finely tuning. Um, but this is kind of the term that we use for it these days. Um, so we're not making that, don't, don't think of us as making that sort of argument that we're going to say, well, the universe is finely tuned. Fine tuned means there's a tuner, therefore there's a tuner. Uh, that's not actually the argument. That's assumed that there's fine tuning, that's, and all we're assuming there is that life hangs uh, in the balance, so to speak, or is, or is balanced on the razor's edge. And it's really not just a razor's edge. That'd be too simple. That'd be almost too 
easy. It's, it's like you've got about 100 razors balanced on their edge, um, and life is, is sort of balanced on top of all that, um, because there's a bunch of different ways in which things could be ever so uh, slightly different, and there would be no life in the universe. Okay, so there is a kind of fine-tuning. Everybody knows that. And what we mean by that is, again, that it, it shouldn't be that there's life in the universe. Uh, Fine-tuning the cosmos is due either, then, to physical necessity. It had to be this way. Chance, we lucked out, or design. It's not due to physical necessity or chance, as we'll argue. Therefore, it follows from this in a deductively valid way that it's, that it's due to design. Okay, now how do we get there? Okay, so premise one is just meant to state all the options, so that's fairly uncontroversial. Most of it's going to be uh, centered around two again by ruling out physical necessity or chance. And really, physical necessity is hard to hard hard one. Um, most people don't think that the universe had to be this way. Had to be this way. It is this way, but the idea is that it could have been vastly different. Right? So anybody that holds to a multiverse, we'll talk about that here in a minute, thinks that the universe didn't have to be this way. Because the multiverse is going to be a, a, a way, you know, perhaps even an in, infinite number of ways in which the universe could have been. Uh, but it's not that way. The universe is, a, is this way, but it didn't have to, is the point. It's not, it's not physical necessity in any sense. And, by the way, it has to, um, I say here, no, because the universe starts this way independently of the laws of nature, right? So it's sort of like, it's saying this, we're, we're not talking about the laws of nature operating in a certain way. A lot of, when we talk about the fine-tuning, is the initial conditions of the universe. It's the way in which the universe had to be sort of dialed in from the front end, before natural laws could sort of take their place. Um, but it seems to be the case that these laws are utterly arbitrary in this following sense, just that they, they are this way with no obvious explanation for being this way. Right, so physical necessity, again, you don't find many people defending this. And if there was some natural law, um, then this law would also imply design. The idea being, if there was some sort of like prior law that made for the laws of the universe, why, why are those laws? It just kicks it back one, one layer, one step, and we can ask the sort of fine-tuning question about that previous law of nature. Nobody posits anything like that, but that's, that's the kind of way it would have to go if they did. So it's very difficult to make this go that the universe came to be finely tuned on the basis of physical necessity. So you really are left with, if you look at the argument there in premise two, you're left with chance. It just happened to be this way if you're to avoid the design implication. All right, so let's look at this, chance. Here, the view would be that we simply got lucky it didn't have to be this way, but it is this way, and it's just this way. Get over it. Uh, now, that's one, one route. The other route is to say, well, we're just part of this bigger sort of orchestra of universes, um, or symphony of, a symphony of uh, universes, or however the, the metaphor goes, uh, where, again, this is a little bit hard to get our minds around, but the very serious option that people are considering and defending is this idea of a multiverse. That we are, now again, we're not talking about galaxies. I mean, it's the same kind of basic principle. Um, and I've actually heard somebody, a serious thinker, argue, hey, we used to think it was just the Earth, just our planet, right? And we came to realize, no, these lights in the sky, are, those are other heavenly bodies. Those are other things. 
And so then we realized there was a solar system, this broader layer. And then at some point we realized there's a galaxy out there, that we're part of a galaxy. And then we thought that's all there was. And then we realized there's a universe filled with, you know, how, who, I don't remember how many galaxies, trillions, I think, of galaxies uh, out there. And so we just need to go that next level and say, oh, now we realize there's a multiverse. <laughs> this was the argument they gave. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that you can't discover the multiverse. You can't, you can't have any empirical evidence that it exists. It's purely theoretic. Uh, you, in other words, you can't go there. You can't see there. You can't, you can't have any evidence like that. It's a model that people create mathematically. Um, how, how that all works, I, I'm not sure, but that's, that's the way in which they argue for the multiverse, is because they can make a mathematical model that's, that's logically consistent. Um, but that's the claim, is that there's actually a multiverse. I mean, it, again, it, it begins to be the case that, you know, what's easier to believe? There are <laughs> infinite number of parallel universes with people just like you and me, except for one hair is missing or one atom is missing from you and the person that looks just like you, or God exists and God created the universe in, and designed it in a special sort of way for human life to exist. What, what, in other words, what's harder? I feel, it feels like the multiverse is harder in this way to think that there's an infinite or at least indefinite or many, many, many uh, universes that exist with people just like me uh, in them, except I, I wore a different shirt today. Right, or I'm a little bit taller, uh, or I'm not from New Jersey, or something like that. Right, that seems crazy. That seems science fiction-y. Um, I, I find it much more plausible. <laughs> God exists. Sorry? You can't visit, you can't prove them, you can't empirically discover them. Well, that's right. It sounds a lot like faith in the bad kind of faith, the, the blind sort of faith, because... Um, Right, they they really only just make that, and I, I don't actually even think we'll talk about this in a minute. And so I'm sort of, sort of jumping ahead, but uh, I don't even think this this explains away the need uh, for God, because I think again it just sort of pushes the need for God back one level, because how did all the universes get here? How do why are they the way that they are? Don't you need something that holds into being those things too? And I say, yeah, like philosophically speaking, the multiverse does nothing to to take you know God out of the picture, actually. Even though you know most people think that it does, but I just I don't see how that's plausible at all. It just complicates things, really. Uh, but we'll talk about that here in a minute. So the, the idea of chance. So it's either that we got lucky, it's just a pure accident. We just happen to be this way with no explanation whatsoever. Uh, or it's a kind of multiverse situation. So let's think about the lucky luckiness of it all. Um, one, I just want to point out is how anti-scientific that is, to think that it's just luck, that it has no explanation, it has no further reason for it. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of luck that we've gotten here. Right? That just seems anti-scientific to me. Uh, but I like, uh, uh, I think Robin Collins mentions this example of, uh, uh, from another person, Leslie, uh, example of the firing squad. This is where 50 sharpshooters all line up relatively close distance to shoot you, right? But they miss, or shoot somebody, but they miss. Now it's possible they just, I mean, people miss, even sharpshooters miss from time to time. It's possible that they ju you just got lucky. But tell me, what's more plausible? Is it more plausible that they got lucky and all missed, you got lucky and they all missed, or that they decided intentionally to miss? Right? If that were to happen, all of us, without effort, would say, something's going on here. Somebody, told, somebody got to those guys and told them, miss, make it you know, close, but don't, don't hit them. But could it happen that they all miss? Yeah, it could. It's logically possible. It's just not plausible. And we would, we would never be uh, very rational to believe that. Uh, Plantinga uses the example of um, if you're 
again, none of us play poker or anything. I'm sorry that poker keeps coming up here, but uh, <laughs> we're all good about this. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not an expert at all. And I, in fact, I've, I've, I haven't played for years. But anyway, um, in all honesty, but uh, if we were playing poker and, and the guy dealing kept getting like 10 royal flushes in a row, and he said, hey, it's possible. You know, you roll this dice not, not enough times, you're going to get 10 royal flushes. You would never believe that, though, right? Everybody, I, I think, in planning, as example, is going for their six shooter kind of thing, um, the, you know, Wild West kind of idea. Um, why? Because it's much more plausible that there's been an intentionality there, that somebody's cheating, than to think, oh, you just happen to be in a world in which 10 royal flushes were dealt with. In a row, you know, in a row to the guy dealing them, right? Um, so yeah, it can be lucky. That's possible, but never plausible. It, you know, for all practical purposes, it's impossible. I mean, really, the improbabilities get to be such a, again, just so crazy that it's so cra crazily uh, improbable 